So today we will be talking about uh, MICA, uh, Markets in, in Crypto Assets Regulation. Uh, those uh, consist of important rules for tokens and service providers. So the goal of regulations is to prevent money laundry and finance terrorism. Um, but other parties involved will also feel the consequences. So uh, these micro regulations are not anti-crypto. They just want to create regulatory clarity for European crypto industry, same as in United States and elsewhere. Key focus behind MICA is about investor protection, um, financial stability, and market integrity. Um, also, the Russians are using uh, crypto to avoid uh, sanctions. Um, and all that being said, according to 2022 crypto crime report, only 0.15% of transactions are related to criminal activity. Um, so early proposals um, for this bill had some crazy ideas, um, like uh, requiring uh, KYC for all the NFT marketplaces, uh, banning the DeFi, and uh, crashing the BTC price to get rid of proof of work. Crypto lobbies, uh, groups in European Union were able to mobilize in time to convince members of European Parliament to remove proof of work ban from MICA in March. And the vote for this was uncomfortably close. Um, ban was due to unjustified uh, environmental concerns. And uh, it doesn't contain any crazy proposals about tracking uh, crypto transactions. Uh, however, those are in a different bill, TFR, TFR, uh, which stands for Transfer of Funds Regulation, that wants uh, KYC to be applied to every single crypto DX. So in this presentation, I will not be going into TFR. This is a different regulation, um, but yeah, some crazy ideas. And so overview of the regulation. Uh, Michael Bill seeks to set standards for things like transparency of crypto projects, the governance of crypto projects and custodity of cryptocurrencies, all in the name of user protection, free market, competition, et cetera. Bill, Bill introduces a crypto licensing framework for the European Union and establishes requirements for stable coins, as well as identity verification requirements for crypto exchanges. MICA sets up different categories. Um, for example, coins and tokens, stable coins, NFTs, and utility tokens. And then it sets up regulated activities with those forms of tokens. Um, uh, so regulated activities consist of two parts. I think we are still, yeah, we are still on this slide. Um, regulate issuing of crypto assets and regulate service providers, so exchanges. Michael Bill was tabled by European Union Commission in September 2020 and passed to European Parliament and European Council for deliberation shortly after. If companies doesn't uh, comply, if they will not comply to regulations, they won't be able to address uh, European customers anymore. Uh, author of this bill is uh, Stefan Berger from Germany. MICA is expected to move into force in a uh, second quarter of 2023. 
it will become a regulation once it's passed, meaning it will overrule all existing laws in European countries uh, when it comes to cryptocurrency. For a long time, most of the discussion about MICA were about uh, were taking place behind closed doors. Nobody knew for sure what it will look like once it becomes law. Uh, one of the only reasons we know anything at all is because of leaks to the press. Um, requirements for the issuers. Framework requires issuers of crypto assets to publish white papers with technical roadmaps for platforms to register with regulators and for stablecoins issuers to hold capital. MICA will harmonize crypto regulations across Europe. This means that the crypto projects of company just needs to get regulatory approval in one European country, and it will allow them to do business in all other 26. That should make it easier for crypto projects and companies to scale within Europe and will simultaneously provide much needed regulatory clarity for institutional investors across Europe. Stablecoin reserves need to be segregated and insulated and ensure that consumers are fully protected in case of insolvency. Um, there are three main categories addressed by MICA. Um, so basically, this is like segmenting uh, cryptocurrency into utility tokens, asset reference tokens, aka ARTs, and e-money tokens, like aka EMTs. And now we will look into detail in uh, each of those categories, how they are addressed. So there will be some exceptions that this uh, law will not uh, take into account. And those are security tokens, um, like tokenized stocks. Then we have uh, tokens or NFTs that are offered as part of loyalty or reward programs. And we have uh, NFTs. Um, now, NFTs are a bit unclear and I will get uh, uh, to this later, um, but theoretically they do not come under the micro regulation. Um, however, they will need to qualify as unique and non fungible. Okay, so let's first check the utility tokens. These are basically every cryptocurrency that's not. Uh, ART or EMT, it will include ERC20 tokens like MANA, um, LINK, and it will also include native uh, cryptocurrencies, so coins like Ethereum and Bitcoin. In order to conduct an ICO or have its token listed on exchanges in European Union, the team or company behind project must provide detailed white paper and register with relevant regulators explaining how their currency works. Now, this doesn't apply to Bitcoin and Ethereum, and I will get to why a bit later. When it comes to utility tokens, the final draft of MICA didn't have so much to say about them. This is because the focus of MICA is fundamentally to protect the European Union uh, from succumbing to a foreign currency of some kind. However, an interesting provision on page 40 says, I quote, no requirements of this regulation should apply to crypto assets that are automatically created as a reward for the maintenance of the DLT or the validation of transactions in the context of a consensus mechanism. So basically this is addressing the miners. Uh, and this is also the reason why the why the native currencies will not be a subject of MICA. Um, on the page 179, 
is another interesting provision about utility tokens, suggesting that the crypto project that conducts an ICO must complete its DAP or blockchain, whatever the project they have, basically, uh, within one year of the white paper being issued. This is to prevent uh, someone issuing a white paper and conducting ICO, but then changing what the project is about later down the line. <laughs> Pascal, you are laughing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's kind of a real problem we have. So in this case, I agree with them, but it's uh, good to regulate that. So yeah. what, what does completed in that regard mean? Because like, is it is the project ever finished? I think it's not like uh, finished. It's just uh, launched. Like if they will have a like a yeah, it's like a blockchain or a smart contract. It just must be launched. Okay. And most of the white papers have uh, timelines also, probably. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But uh, often, like uh, they don't stick with what uh, they are initially stating. So, <laughs> yeah. It's a good thing. Um, okay, moving on. We have uh, asset reference tokens or ARTs. And uh, these are stable coins like uh, DAI. Uh, basically include any crypto that maintain a stable peg thanks to a basket of multiple assets. This presumably includes decentralized stable coins like MakerDAO. Uh, however, this isn't entirely clear. Uh, ARTs uh, don't have to register with regulators so long as their market cap doesn't exceed 5 million euros, which is a very low uh, threshold to say the least. Um, holders of uh, ARTs uh, are not allowed to earn interest of any kind. So there will be like no yield farthing on the stable coins. Um, European Banking Authority has the power to step in and slap on additional requirements for uh, ART issuer. If a uh, market cap of the ART becomes too large in the regulator uh, eyes. Any cryptocurrencies that derive their value from uh, some basket of assets. Um, yeah, those would be addressed in ARTs. Uh, so basically, the issuer don't have to register um, if the market cap does not exceed $5 million. Uh, 5 million euros, sorry, 5 million euros. And if they exceed this limit, they must uh, hold high quality reserves and cannot allow holders of the ARTs to earn yield. Yeah, that's already said. Um, and finally, we have uh, e-money tokens or EMTs. Um, these are centralized stable coins, such as Tether's USDT, Circle's USDC, and Paxos BUSD. Issuers will be subjected to more or less the same rules as ARTs. They don't have to jump uh, through too many regulatory loopholes, so long as their market caps remain small. EMT issuers cannot allow EMT holders to earn interest. So this is like very similar to ART. Only real difference is EMT issuers still have to register as electronic money institution so that uh, European regulators can make sure their EMTs don't threaten integrity of Europe. If EMTs grow large enough to be considered significant by uh, European banking regulators, uh, you can bet that they will come knocking. One second. 
stable coins deemed significant would have their transaction volumes capped at 200 million euros per day. This is a very low uh, since all cryptos trade against stable coins. As you might have guessed, these uh, restrictions around stable coins, uh, be they ARTs or EMTs, are due to European Union's fears uh, that the stable coin could displace the euro. They are becoming more acute as the euro declines against the United States dollar. EMT regulation on page uh, 77 specifies that transaction limits on stable coins will only apply to payments. This is important because stable coins like USDT and USDC have no usage cap in other contexts. They can be used for trading in DeFi and other non-payment purposes with no limits. Many of the regional EMT restrictions will still apply to US dollar stable coins. This means that only Euro stable coins will not be subject to restrictions, which makes sense given that they don't uh, compete with Euro. Another interesting stable coin provision is on page 987. It suggests that stable coin issuers will not be allowed to charge any fees for minting and redeeming their stable tokens. I would like to talk a little bit about Euro stablecoin because I think it's like uh, closely related to, uh, to EMTs and to why, uh, the reason for these regulations. The reason why we didn't see uh, Euro stablecoin until recently was because base interest rates in Eurozone were negative. This means that the Euro stablecoin issuer uh, wouldn't stand to make any money holding European government debt to back a Euro stablecoin. That is why Circle revealed a, a Euro based uh, stablecoin shortly before the ECB started raising interest rates. It is safe to say that the circle is now perfectly positioned to take advantage of the uh, favorable stablecoin provisions in the final MICA draft. So I will go over this one more time. Um, basically, uh, issuer of a regulated euro denominated stablecoin would want to back it with uh, European government debt to earn a safe yield. But uh, Euro interest rates are negative since uh, 2014, I believe. Um, meaning there's no really financial uh, incentive to create Euro stablecoin on the issuer end. European Central Bank has recently raised interest rates above zero for the first time in a decade. If successful, this could set the stage for the launch of Euro stablecoin. Regulating crypto technologies into um, okay. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna skip this part. <laughs> it's not relevant. Uh, so we had the, the latest micro draft was uh, released recently and it has revealed that some of the restrictions on centralized stable coins had been removed. A final draft released in September uh, is a whooping uh, 1050 pages long. It is the final text that will officially become law in just a few months. Previous versions didn't have any details about NFTs uh, at all and seemed to imply that DeFi protocols would have to register with regulators. In the final draft, uh, Micah author specified that fractionalized NFTs will be treated like uh, utility tokens. This means that issuers of fractionalized NFTs will have to register with regulators present the white paper and all the other stuff. Authors say uh, 
I quote, the issuance of crypto assets as non-fungible tokens in a large series or collection should be considered as an indicator of their fungibility. This means that uh, if there is an NFT with a large collection of similar looking uh, JPEGs, uh, they may also be the subject to regulation. According to Patrick, and I'm sorry, I did not uh, present who Patrick is, I will do it in a little bit. It is likely that regulators will decide the fungibility of NFT collection on a case by case basis. He's also concerned that the extra uh, scrutiny could be applied to larger NFT collections, including popular ones like uh, Bored Ape uh, Yacht Club. And we have a DeFi application. This is maybe the most confusing part about this uh, bio. Uh, basically, it's the author has specified that MICA does not apply to DeFi. I quote, where crypto asset services as defined in this regulation are provided in a fully decentralized manner without any intermediary, they do not fall in the scope of this regulation. This begs the question of what decentralized means. It will be decided on a case by case basis and it's a bit concerning as it leaves the door open to biased regulation. Final draft of MICA notes that the report will be issued next year that will address feasibility of regulating DeFi in European Union. A significant milestone for crypto rules in European Union was reached on October 5th as the European Council, Council endorsed and published the approved text of the much anticipated MICA law. The act, which is set to take effect in 2024, still has to be voted into, the, into law by European Parliament, which the vote is anticipated in December. It's important to note that uh, no more changes will be made and this vote is just a formality. Uh, so the MICA uh, bill is pretty much complete and shouldn't be changed too much. We should see the official uh, regulations published no later than February next year. And the uh, MICA will immediately become law the moment it is published, but there will be a transitional period for the regulators within it. Stablecoin related regulations will come into force roughly one year from publication, so early 2024. The rest of the crypto regulations will come into force around 18 months after publication, so mid to late 2024. According to speculations, so this is like, uh, like maybe a biased opinion, I'll take it with a reserve. Uh, this is roughly when the next crypto bull run will begin. That's why MICA could be extremely bullish for the crypto market. It will bring regulator, regulatory clarity to institutional investors in Europe at around the same time when interest uh, in cryptocurrency will be on the rise. This in turn could give a rise to lots of promising uh, European crypto projects and companies, but there is one problem. All the regulatory compliance could make it hard for new crypto projects to get off the ground within Europe. This is especially true of any crypto project trying to create uh, decentralized stable coins, which would be subject to list of limitations as ARTs. It might also be tricky for DeFi protocol to get off the ground as their success will depend on whether regulations, regulators classify them as decentralized or not. Yeah, so the DeFi is still under the question and this uh, decentralization question is like uh, not very clear what it means to be decentralized.
to what degree. So basically, this is uh, mostly it for the presentation. Um, and I would just like to mention uh, Patrick Hansen. Uh, he is a European crypto policy expert and hedge fund advisor. And he's been posting updates about Micah on the Twitter. He has a very interesting ideas. If you are uh, interested in the topic, I invite you to check out his uh, Twitter profile. That's it. All right. Thank you. That was great. Thanks. Uh, is there any questions? <laughs> yeah. Uh, like, one is a question, one is like something where I would want your opinion, basically. Uh, the first question is that um, you said that uh, probably the issuers are not allowed to um, take any fees for uh, minting new tokens or redeeming tokens for fiat currency. And right. you also said that uh, the issuers uh, would not be able to use that money for uh, generating interest. Yes, that's correct. So why would anyone want to start a, a stable coin company at all? Um, so basically it has to do with the interest rate, which was mentioned um, here. So uh, how this works, it's like the issuer of the stable coin is backs up his uh, cryptocurrency with the fiat currency. Yeah. Like uh, have it in the bank or I don't know how it works. And yeah. uh, he gets like uh, interest rate based on the amount that he has on the bank. But unfortunately, like uh, in the Europe, it's been, uh, I think 2012 was the last year that the the interest was actually positive and uh, now it's coming to to be like a positive yield again in the i think recently um so yeah it wasn't feasible basically to answer your question it wasn't feasible for the issuer to to stake the fiat currency since the there was no interest or there was a negative interest rate that is also one of the reasons why we saw a lot more uh, usd uh, backed stable coins compared to the euro. So that essentially means that uh, if I start a stable coin company and with the money, fiat money that I have in the bank, there is no restrictions on that, on the fiat money. You, yeah. Well, there are some restrictions like uh, transaction volumes are capped at 200 million euros per day. And this is like not so much when you think about it. Since, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think what uh, Raul was asking is about the, um, the treasuries that you own then, right? Like the money, the fiat money that you have inside the bank, not the crypto on chain. Uh, yeah. I guess like there would probably be some normal reserve ratios that you have to fulfill similar to now in the banking system, um, yeah. just probably a lot uh, more restrict. Yes, correct. It's, uh, so basically this is more related like to the banking system than it is to the crypto. Yeah, I, that, that is, that's correct. Um, I also know that uh, I think last year Circle with USDC uh, also said that they only have 61% of their reserve <clears throat> is being backed by by fiat. The rest that they they have either lent out or in bonds or something. So they use definitely a percentage of that fiat money that they have to generate yield, whether it's through yeah lending it out or doing bonds or anything like that. That's one revenue income stream that they have. But there is definitely... Um, a certain percentage that they have to keep. Um, probably it's going to be a bit higher in the EU. Yeah, right. Okay, and, and the second uh, point of discussion was simply uh, like where you mentioned how do you like um, verify whether a protocol is decentralized or not? Uh, because um, let's talk about Maple Finance. Maple Finance is a lending protocol. So it is definitely a Web3 product. 
but what happens there is uh, you have uh, pool managers and pool managers are basically people audited by maple finance itself who will handle the money of the people so it is a web3 protocol but i don't think it is decentralized uh, is this what we will, will be evaluated by the um, eu court or like do they mean something else when they say that uh, we would like to evaluate whether it is uh, decentralized or not um, yeah so uh, this is a bit problematic the way it currently stands uh, the projects will be evaluated on a case by case uh, uh, individually like independently um, okay. and yeah it is it is there is no definition like uh, what they mean by decentralized so it's it's a bit relative and uh, the only thing that I could find like about uh, uh, improving this this bill or making changes to it is they they basically stated that uh, they will specify more clearly what it means for the for the DeFi uh, finance in the next year. Okay, so that is it from my end. Any other questions? It's probably interesting to see what this in the end means for users like us and also for you know i mean it's probably going to be a bit more dramatic for projects especially if you want to launch a token in the eu but yeah it, it will probably always be a bit harder to do that here pascal um yeah i i was just sending something in the chat for everyone in case this comes up at some point um and yeah about this like and deciding this on an individual basis this is not directly a question or something just the first impression is thinking bad about uh, how the world wide web started and there was yahoo which wanted to uh, rank all websites based by individual uh, reviews by smart people and this way like you know make a search engine and then were totally overwhelmed because every second there were thousands of new websites created and this sounds a little bit like this again i mean everyone can in 20 minutes deploy a new lending protocol or a new smart contract a new token there's no way anyone can do this uh, like only smart people or politician look into the code and uh, decide on something there needs to be an automatic way to do this or no way in the end i mean that's like what i think it's yeah i cannot believe it works otherwise yeah Totally agree. I think that this part uh, of the bill should be clarified. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Or someone has something to add? So overall, it also seems to again go this way, similar to with uh, GDPR, like DSGVO. Uh, the data protection law in the EU, which says that um, every company in the world has to follow this law as long as you have a European customer. Um, it again seems to go this kind of direction, right? That uh, every decentralized protocol has to follow their laws as long as it's uh, as long as there's one European, like for all the European customers. If I understood it correctly, yeah, Marvin, you okay? Yeah. Yeah, because this sounds again a little bit like, I, I don't know how this can work. I mean, if there's a Chinese company or some Russian company doing like some data uh, invalidation, like illegal things with data, how should the European Union access them? I mean, it's not that every country is happily like punishing their well financial suited companies because of some other country's law. It's... Uh, uh, I have the impression it's, it seems a little bit arrogant, imperialistic on the world again, like from the Western world. Just, yeah. Mm, I would I would say so too. I think the yeah the the at least from my point of view, the laws and the regulations that we have in our world are still not very adapted to the digital real reality that we live in. 
Um, I think we already see this in a lot of crypto projects, or at least some of them, where you have a pop up uh, at the beginning where you have to say, okay, I'm not a US citizen, I'm not from here, I'm not from there. And then you can use it. I mean, in the end, maybe at some point you have to click that you're not from the US, not from the EU, not from China, not from Ruslan, uh, Ruslan, Russia. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of weird. I think there is still a lot of progress to be made um, because, I mean, realistically, it's still an open network and um, let's hope that they, <laughs> they leave it open. So, yeah. Um, but I, I do agree on your point. Yeah. It's kind of, kind of weird for me just to assume that now everyone will play according to the use rule and otherwise they, I don't know what, what are they going to do? Yeah. I mean, in the worst case, you like need to show power, right? That's kind of like, you need to send mm -hmm. the police or something. And, uh, on the nation scale, this means like some, yeah, not police, something stronger than but yeah that's true i mean in the end they do have power i mean they could just freeze your exchange accounts if you at some point want to cash out if they see that you have used protocols uh, i don't know tornado cash whatever um that's probably going to happen at some point um but yeah i hope that there will always be solutions like tornado cash where you know you can <laughs> Even if you didn't do anything bad, you can still, maybe you don't want the European regulators to see what you did with your coins. Um, but even that, some exchanges already limit deposits if they see that you have them directly from Tornado Cash. So yeah, it's, it's probably not going to get easier, but we'll see. All right. Thank you for the great presentation, Ace. That was that was interesting. I think yeah. even if you don't live in the EU, it's always interesting to see what the EU is doing on that end because it's just one of the biggest markets in crypto still. There's probably China, Russia, and US, and EU, I would say, for now at least. So it's yeah, it's interesting to see. So yeah, very very good work. Thank you. Sure. Um, yeah, I think that the, like uh, when it comes to this regulation. I think like uh, maybe Europe is a little bit concerned also with the currency dropping like uh, compared to the dollar. And if we start to use crypto more and more in everyday life, like for purchasing, if we only are packed to the dollar, it's like a bad deal for the Europe, right? So wanna address this a little bit. And uh, when it came to like, uh, they had official reasoning that uh, they want to prevent the uh, the financing of terrorism and uh, um, other, what was it? Um, money laundering. Uh, money laundering, yeah, that, that's it. And the money laundering. I think that like if, if someone wants to do like an Ill illegal act like this, they can probably find a way to do it uh, either way. And uh, if the, like Europe uh, poses some very strict uh, regulations for the regular users, they're just gonna uh, like make it harder for, for, for users of technology to operate basically. But I don't know if they will really prevent so much uh, of this bad stuff. <laughs> it's, it's always an argument for control. Like, uh, as you said, like people find a way to break stuff every time. Yeah.